out there probably. Uh, what's that? Recording. I just started recording. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, hopefully we're uh, getting our seed drilled already this spring. It's that time. It's warming up, at least in Washington yeah. State. Um, My pasture is green. Yep. Uh, nice to have some moisture here. I know other places are looking at uh, lack of moisture, but that's a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. So we'll go ahead and get started. I thought this was just a little entertaining. Um, someone here at the office saw this. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep. So a little humor to get the morning started. So topics today. Um, you know, I always have to be a little bit different. So we got our microbe man, Sam, down here in the left-hand corner. But uh, I will use microbes when I can. I will use microbes, Sam, I am. I will use microbes in the soil. I pray Exxon Mobil doesn't spill any more oil. I will use microbes as a foliar feed. I will use microbes when my soil is in need. I will feed microbes because I can. Microbes are not a fan of green eggs and ham. They just need to try them. I, well, they you have. You just got to try them. I, you know, we, in the lab, we fed some and they didn't like them. <laughs> yeah, they weren't happy yeah, we're with them at all. So... This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit of soil inoculation. We're going to talk about bioremediation. Mm -hmm. We're going to talk about foliar feeding. And we're going to talk about feeding biology, all uh, with the idea of how that helps with nutrient availability and nutrient acquisition for the plant, because it's so critical in overall plant health. So with that, we start to talk about management. And so often when we talk about management, it's how we treat our soils, water, tillage, fertilization, compaction. But what we really need to think about, kind of as this picture is showing, we see this dust storm. It almost looks like it's alive eating this city. And really, I mean, if we think of our soil, it is alive. Um, when we think of management, we can't only think of fertilization of the soil and tillage within that soil environment, we have to also think about the idea of that microbial community that's living within that soil environment because it is alive. So anytime we do anything to this environment, we, you know, we always talk about tillage disrupting that biology, but how does biology relate to that and how do we keep it alive is really what we want to talk about. And Bruce, I always put this quote up because it just fits, I think, so well, is everything in this universe is connected to everything else. You cannot isolate one mineral, soil, microbe, plant, animal, or human component and treat that component as though the others don't exist. Once you gain an understanding of that interrelated character of all things, and that's really when we're talking about on management, everything is I mean, everything is interrelated. Yeah. Every time we do something to our soil environment, we have an impact on our plant, mm -hmm. on our soil, on our water holding capability. And yep. most importantly, what we want to talk about today is that microbial community and how we keep it alive. So I often see this as a regenerative agriculture as a process. And it doesn't matter whether we're an organic farmer or what stage of regenerative agriculture we're in or if we're a conventional grower and we're trying to implement some organic practices to get us to that next level, to try and make a change within our soil environment. And what I tell growers all the time, and, I, and it really brings it to light at this time of year, is it takes time. Yeah. That's one of the things that we have to understand. Um, you know, there's a quote out there that the oxen is slow, but the earth is patient. Um, I know. Okay. He, he moves slow, he does. but the earth is patient. It'll wait for him. And I mean, to do what? To make a change, to oh, get to where he's going, okay, to okay. make that pass. To make some buffalo chips. Yeah. It's, we, we all can get there in a, a given point of time, depending on what we're doing. And when I say it's a process, we have multiple moving parts over time. And so not only are we managing these practices that we're implementing, but they all move, they all change the environment, mm -hmm. mother nature, water, all of those things impact this process and how it works. And these changes build upon each other. So the more of these changes that we can make, the faster we can actually stair step, kind of as yeah. Dr. Hatfield talks yeah. about, and make this stair step climb. And these changes are not only in the plant. So often that's what we focus in. We focus on growth, we focus on yield, we focus on quality, but it also happens in the soil. And a lot of that 
the way I look at it, we need it to happen in the soil before we can actually make these changes in the plant. And the most important thing as, as a grower, we also have to make changes in order for this to be successful. Kind of our management style has to change a little bit and our philosophies have to change in order to get really to where we're going. We have to believe in it. We have to really implement it and think about it. As Bruce said, everything is interrelated. Well, absolutely. And the, the one thing when we're starting to incorporate these practices, Mother Nature's time scale, the Holocene, which is the recent, is 10,000 years. We don't have time for the buffalo all the time. Sometimes we got to speed it along. And that's what some of these management changes, the additions of biologicals, carbon-based fertility. We can take that, what would normally take nature decades to do and compress that down into a matter of years. We put roller skates on that buffalo to move them faster. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, in most contemporary agriculture systems, macronutrients are provided through the application of mineral fertilizers. Um, yeah. Um, however, unsustainable fertilizer practices are contributing to a large scale, scale alteration of the earth's biochemical cycles. And really what I want to say with fertilizer prices or where they're at today, yeah. over fertilization is just not sustainable in agriculture anymore. It just with the prices when we start to talk about wheat or corn, I mean, they're, they're varying all the time, but we just cannot over apply fertilizers to grow the crop, just financially, we can't yeah. do it. Let alone when we start to talk about what that is doing to our soil environment, to our waterways, to our greenhouse gases, all of those things we think about. And before it was kind of like we're sitting in the coffee shop and the coffee shop's on fire, we're drinking our coffee. Ah, it's fine, it's fine. It was cheap, we could get away yep. with it. But now we have to think about and make those changes so that we can actually make that change in the cycle. Well, and these, those are gonna keep going up, especially with nitrogen is expensive and expensive right now, mostly because of what's going on in the world, but 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. So we have a large supply theoretically available. Phosphorus, Phosphorus. on the other hand, yeah. What, 85% is in Morocco? Yeah. There's only, what, five countries in the world have the vast majority, 95% plus of all the phosphorus mines in the world. That's that's scary. We can't continue using phosphorus that way. No, and I, I was just reading an article the other day is, is that's one of the things that they're talking about is the limit of phosphorus, not only of where it is, but yeah. the availability. It will run out. Yes. Um, so, I mean, we have to think about that. And a lot of times it's utilizing what we put into our soil environment Efficiency. optimally. Yeah. So... With that, we always start with test, don't guess. Every fertility program has to start with analysis. Um, we can't emphasize this enough. Um, so often I see, and I talk about this all the time, excesses have a, uh, are harder to overcome than a deficiency in most cases, because if we have a deficiency, we can apply something, make sure through microbial activity within that soil environment, it's available to the plant. When we have an act excess in that soil, we're managing things where we displace something to have that ex excess. So now how do we get whatever we displaced back into that plant? And it's not only soil analysis, it's also uh, leaf extract, tissue analysis, yep. plant sap analysis. We have to kind of take a look at those. Once we have that, and water extract, water. I guess. Well, and water itself. And water, yeah. yeah. I mean, water quality, um, as kind of that slide of management talks about, it's it's went downhill. Sodium issues, yeah. high nitrate issues. Actually, how much fertilizer can we get just from our irrigation water? <clears throat> I know some of the cities that have the purple pipes pulling out of some of those pretty uh, pretty fertilized rivers. Yeah, you don't have to pay for fertilizer. That's right. So with that being said, not only do we have to have that information, <laughs> but we have to know what is in it. And I talk about we all often talk about compost. Um, what is in our compost? Do a compost analysis, have an understanding of that. It's kind of like adding 25 units of vitamin B to your donuts. It gives you pep and vigor. Those are vitamin donuts. Oh, yeah. Those are good for you. That's great for um, you. But they're still donuts. Mm -hmm. they're, they still have a, can have a negative effect. Once in a while, is it good? Yep, okay. but just not on a regular basis. And here's an example. This came to me, a very good grower. I mean, the guy's an amazing grower, pays attention to everything. Um, and this product that he used, um, it's labeled for a lot of different things. It's labeled for sunburn. It's labeled for insect control. It's 
uh, labeled for doubles on cherries. I mean, there's a lot of reasons that you might utilize this product. But the amazing thing that he saw was the fact that uh, he applied this product and suddenly saw a decline in his trees. And it was, he took a plant sap analysis and he noticed that 85.6 parts per million of aluminum, it immediately went up in the plant. Now, to give you an idea, somewhere around five parts per million is the recommended rate on this sample. And so now suddenly we went to 85. It took him the rest of the year in order to correct this issue in the plant because of that excess. And what I look at on that is, okay, now we've hurt that plant or that tree based off of yield for this year because of the excessive aluminum. But we also have to think about what did we do that tree for next year because it's already yes. produced next yes. year's crop. So this may be a two year cycle based on one application of a product that we thought was something good that actually brought in, I, I guess, piggyback on it. Yeah. yeah, and I see this a lot on fertilizers. We mm -hmm. see this chloride, aluminum, sodium. We're starting to see a lot of excesses in those. And then we start to displace other nutrition. For example, excessive sodium and calcium. I mean, as we start to think about that process, it is all really related. And so that's a hidden Detriment. detriment? Yeah. yeah. There are also hidden benefits. And a lot of times when we talk about microbial communities, that's the way I refer to it as a hidden benefit. We don't always see what's going on. I mean, I kind of, the success is not always what you see. I mean, uh, this picture here on the right is a carrot out of my garden. This was late October after the frost. I set it up next to my pumpkins just because I thought it was kind of cool to show the size. Little, little mini pumpkins? Yeah, those little baby ones that I grow. Teeny, it makes the carrot look big, though. Next to your candy corn. Yeah, my yeah. candy corn. Yeah. So talking about genetic potential and what can our crops do if we actually give them the things they need. And so much of that starts with that biological community within that yeah. soil environment. Interaction between plants and the microbiota and soil both plants and microorganisms obtain their nutrient from the soil and change the properties by organic litter decomposition and metabolic activities. So what this is saying is we need that biology and plants communicate with microorganisms through metabolic exudates yeah. by that soil environment. So I've got that little picture of sugar down there. So often we talk about exudates it's your sugar. sugar. Yeah, it's, we it's think sugar. About it. mm -hmm. But when we really start to think about it, it's a communication process. And as we see here, the microorganisms, the plant and the soil, they all communicate with each other through this process in order to supply the plant basically what it needs. Mm -hmm. So we have to go beyond the idea of just, I guess, calling it sugar. And so much of that comes to the idea of these primary metabolites comprise of many different types of organic compounds, including not limited to carbohydrates, mm -hmm. lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. All of these things are what that plant is putting into that soil. And these primary metabolites have functions that are essential to plant growth and development. They're, they have to be there. They yes. have to be present in yes. order for that plant to grow and develop. And that's really what we want to talk about is how do we emphasize these metabolites that this plant can put out to not only feed our soil mm -hmm. and our microorganisms within that soil environment, but also then to feed the plant, because that's really what it is. They're, they're all related. And because of the importance of these primary pathways to enable the synthesis, assimilation, degrade of organic compounds, and these my, uh, primary metabolites are essential. Now, uh, John Kemp talks a lot about the secondary metabolites, yes. you know, um, they're not essential to plant growth um, directly, but, directly, but yeah. they really are if you start to think about it just in a different way when yeah. we start to talk about how those secondary metabolites function. Mm -hmm. But today we're going to kind of concentrate a little bit on these primary metabolites. Well, and I think a little bit about, we talked about, you're talking about, it's not just sugar, it's more complex, much like nectar. We used to think nectar was just simple sugar. The reality is it's much more complex. We've talked a little bit in the past, examples of recruitment molecules. Plants are purposefully building molecules 
uh, to attract and to recruit these microbial species in. Uh, we talked about malic acid attracts in Bacillus subtilis and that those benzoxazenoids, which are an antibiotic that corn produces that helps protect the corn directly. But when it spits it out in the environment, it attracts in Pseudomonas, in this case, Pseudomonas butita. So these are very targeted. It's not just blah, vomiting sugar. These plants are doing a very specific thing and they're utilizing those metabolites, secondary metabolites and those molecules for a reason in the soil, aren't they, Dennis? Absolutely. And, you know, in 2013, I think it was, Jill Clapperton spoke mm -hmm. at our tiny oak biological seminar here in Spokane. And one of the things that she talked, different plants actually, I mean. Well, that's just looking at the different forms of nitrogen, nitrogen. that are coming out of the roots. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it varies. And that's one of the reasons why diversity is so important within that soil <laughs> environment. Yep. Um, so when we start to talk about that, there are three mechanisms usually that are put forth to explain how microbial activity boosts plant growth. Manipulating the hormonal signals of the plant, repelling or outcompeting pathogenic microbial strains, and increasing the bioavailability of soil nutrients. And again, today we're going to talk a little bit about boosting those bioavailability of soil nutrients. And it comes down to roots. I mean, that's really what we have to talk, take a look at. And to access these, soil microbes, beneficial bacteria, and fungi are necessary to get that metallic, uh, metabolic machinery to basically make or organic forms of nutrients. I'm not going to say nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur because it goes well, well beyond, beyond that. that. Yep. And that's what we'll really talk about is everything is made more available when we get this system working. And, you know, that's either through turnover, that's through cell lysis, that's through protozoic pred predation, predation, you know, and when we talk about cell lysis, I mean, that happens in the soil, but it doesn't only happen in the soil that basically make them leaky, break them down, pop them, make yeah. everything that's inside that biological community, mm -hmm. make that available. And that's what we're talking about on the cell lysis. Well, and I just wanted to highlight this little spot right here. Plants are dependent on the growth of soil microbes. And that's what we're talking about here. And the, the research of Dr. White that we've talked about before, and this is just a good kind of segue. And since we're talking about nutrition and nutrition acquisition, the rise of phagy cycle is just absolutely critical to understand how plants are extracting nutrition from the soil. Rhizophagy is rhizo is root and phagy is eat. So this is a process where the plants are directly consuming microbes from the soil. So those bacteria, the PGPR and the PG fungi that are in the soil are great at extracting nutrition. That's what they're really good at. They can't photosynthesize for the most part. So they need that carbon. So I, I was chatting with Dennis and kind of talking about this. This, what's going on here kind of reminds me of Hansel and Gretel. The, the plant's kind of the witch here. And so if we look around this growing tip, of the tip meristem of this root, we can see this little hazy cloud, all those little dots. Those are all bacteria, PGPR, that are growing around this environment because this is one of the primary sites that the plant releases those exudates. So the microbes, through a process known as chemotaxis, they have, a lot of them have flagella or cilia, which allows them to be motile, allow them, allows them to move. And through chemotaxis, they're able to basically sniff out the food. So they move towards the food. When they get to this tip meristem, they're just going to continue following that sugar trail right into the witch's house. <laughs> and we think about the root tip as a solid structure. The reality is it's constantly growing very, growing very, very quickly, and it's more porous. It's more like a sieve or a mesh screen. So these microbes can grow into the plant. And then the, the witch kind of slams the door down. And unfortunately for, uh, for this story, this is more of a grim tale. Hansel and Gretel don't do well. The, the plant bombards them with reactive oxygen species. Think about putting peroxide on a wound. It just tears it apart, rips it apart. And then at the end, it's kind of white and weird and broken down. Same thing is happening to those microbes. The plant is bombarding it with these reactive oxygen species, and that partially decomposes, breaks down the cell wall. Some of them pop and die. They lice, as Dennis was talking about, and those just become completely food for the plant. They just eat the entire thing. 
The ones that do survive are swollen and the plant can basically wring them out like a sponge, squeezes the nutrition out of them. Now they're very hungry. The plant then pushes them into this zone where it's either forming new root hairs or it's going to push them out of the existing root hairs back into the soil environment. Dr. White's research has shown that without these microbes, and there are pictures that he collected of tomato seedlings, without those PGPR, without those beneficial microbes, the plant did not develop normal roots. It didn't have root hairs and it looked very brown, dark, dark brown. And that's because the oxygen, the oxygen, the reactive oxygen species actually damaged the root itself if it doesn't have something to work on. So that's what's going on. The, the plant squeezes out the nutrition and then it spits them back out into the soil. And like we just talked about, that's what these microbes are good at. They're good at extracting nutrition from the soil. And so that's what's happening. It's the cycle round and round. The witch captures them, squeezes them, eats them, spits them back out. So they can go right back out and get back to mine. He puts them right back to work. It's, it's like a, a prison where you've, you've got people with jobs and the ones that don't survive, you just eat. The ones that do, wow. you just you kick them back out to go mine <laughs> some more. It is a dark and dirty world down there. So we talk about the rise of Fiji cycle. We talked about number one a little bit right, right there. And that's plants absorb nutrients from the microbes. That's number one that we get from it. Number two is they have increased oxidative stress tolerance in the plants. So when these plants are stressed, they are able to live and survive through that stress even better than they would without these microbes. And we see many, many examples of that. And there's a lot of research looking at how these different organisms help protect the plant. Uh, you can have the, the volatile organic compounds, the microbes are spitting out the basically the breath the plant can utilize. And it uses it kind of as a communication to understand more of what's going on in the soil. Uh, you can have induced systemic resistance and the list goes on. Uh, number three, soil fungal pathogens have reduced virulence. Virulence is the idea of severity. Ebola versus the common cold. Ebola, very, very destructive. And that's one of your, your very damaging fungal pathogens. However, this research has shown that some of these beneficial soil species, the PGPR, can infect those fungal pathogens and it reduces their virulence. It slows them way down. In some cases, Dr. White's found where it actually can make some of those fungal species more beneficial. And the other side of that, a lot of these PGPR have chitinase enzymes that can break down those fungal uh, hyphae because hyphae are made out of chitin. So these microbes can digest some of that chitin and it makes these soil fungi drain. They can become leaky, which again, just leads right, more, right back into more of this rhizophagy more nutrient acquisition, right back to feeding the plant more. And what we see, what we talk about quite a bit is when we look at these bacterial bodies and we think about this associated with the actual consumption of them, on average, these little tiny bacteria are like little fertilizer prills that are basically a 10 to 2 plus traces. And different strains of bacteria are unique in terms of the nutrients they provide to the plant. So utilizing the right species can make a big difference. Nitrogen fixers, phosphate solubilizers, potassium mobilizers, and the list goes on. But we can utilize these organisms directly to extract nutrition. Here's a good example uh, Dr. White did. This is with no bacteria versus with a few different strains of bacillus. And we can see the plant had direct uptake of nitrogen from those organisms. We can see that with nitrogen. We can see that with phosphorus. We can see that with potassium. Dennis was starting off talking about how we've got to have access to those and we've got to change the way that we're doing it. This is the way that nature designed it to be done. And this is the way that we need to do it. To be able to mine and extract that nutrition from the soil, we need those organisms. Oh, and by the way, those organisms also create the soil through humification. So they're building the home. They're building the soil around them as they go. Why is this frozen? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. Sorry, un momento. I don't think the fan is turned on for that little computer. Oh. Uh, so I mentioned the 1022, and we also have traces. We can look at the trace element, the micronutrients, um, as well as the trace elements. And we can see that these microbes are critical for the uptake with bacteria versus without for calcium.
Sorry, I, I clicked. I'm um, just uh, there. It goes uh, sulfur, <laughs> magnesium, manganese, zinc, and the list goes on. And that's because this is where I wanted that picture. That's because all of these organisms need that nutrition. And it's not just like bacteria or these magical organisms that don't have to grow, reproduce, and utilize these these nutrients. They're using them in pretty much exact same ways as we are, they have a phospholipid bilayer that needs phosphorus, they have DNA, RNA, they have all of these, most of these same structures, they don't have organelles, but they have similar componentry inside of their cell, but they need all of that. They've got their own enzymes after produce and they need that nutrition for themselves to reproduce. And when doing so, thankfully, we get to feed the plant, don't we Dennis? Exactly. And so part of that is how do we really get started with all of that? And you know, so often we talk about the springtime, the inferro application obviously is best. Let's get this biological community within that soil environment, right where the plant, the seed can use it. As Steve was talking about a little bit, the idea behind the idea of the, um, this happens immediately at germination. Steve, we're on another one. Um, it happens immediately at germination. When we see germination, we are setting up the entire genetic potential of that plant. So if we can get this biological community within that soil environment, right where that seed needs it, yep. as Dr. Rizophage's research showed, if we don't have Dr. That, or Dr. White's <laughs> in the Rizophage, sorry. sorry, thank you for correcting I me. I liked it. I, I liked, liked it. it. Um, if we don't have it right there, that seed does not, the root hairs do not uh, build properly. We don't develop them no. properly. And uh, you got me all flustered now. I'm not so excited. Anyway, um, so in furrow is best. Seed treatment can be done, but we mm -hmm. have to look at what type of seed we're trying to treat. If we're doing wheat, if we're doing corn, if we have a basically a pore space somewhere where that uh, inoculum can attach to that seed, then we can get it in that soil environment. It works very well. But if we're talking like canola seed or a small, teeny little smooth seed, um, we have to find another way to do it. A lot of uh, growers I have that don't have liquid application or can't do a dry seed treatment in their box. A lot of times with GPS and tractors, we can go out there and do it as an application, knife it in, whatever it might be, um, and get very close to mm -hmm. what we want to do. And the other thing we need to do, as we always have to remember, it's plant specific. When we start to talk about our mycorrhizae anyway, yeah. our endomycorrhizae, 80, 85% of the plants in the world, your brassicas won't create a relationship with it. Obviously, the blue, blueberries, for an example, mm -hmm. have their own the Iroquois mycorrhizae. So we have to have an understanding of a plant. If they don't create a relation, like the spectrum would be a good application of infra, a very diverse, broad spectrum mm -hmm. group of beneficial bacteria. And then, of course, we can talk about our, you talked our nitrogen fixing, mm -hmm. our phosphate yeah. solubilizing, yeah. all our DS, yeah. um, all can Problem be applied solvers. there. Yeah. yeah, but it's based off of our data. Remember I took uh, test, don't guess, yeah. get that soil analysis, get that plant sap, collect that data, have that information to understand if we have a lot of phosphorus in our soil, but we're having a phosphorus deficiency, maybe it makes sense to do the PSB, the phosphate yeah. solubilizing bacteria. So utilizing this information and making a plan to what makes the most sense. And, you know, I always say that if there is a tool that you want and it doesn't exist and you explain it to a farmer and he has an understanding of it, he will build it. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible. I've, it is. It's just amazing. And so here's an example of a grower. Um, their equipment is not set up with liquid application. So what did he do? He's got the little tube he's uh, implement on his equipment. And now he can, a dribble tube, you can see right yeah, here, well, you can see right there, hooks a hose there. tube, comes right down okay. through that. Um, cool part about this, he was talking about when he designed this, he actually sees a vacuum there where, where he and sets it. And when he dribbles that in, it just closes and sets right into the soil. It doesn't clog or mm -hmm. create any problems. Actually, it was really interesting when the amount of engineering, I guess, 
that the went in ingenuity. into something yeah, that's like incredible. this. And he's done that on all his equipment because he has seen the benefit. Remember earlier on, I said, if we're doing something within that soil environment, our management practices, if we do something to disrupt, let's do something else to fix. That may be a food source. That may be a cover crop. That may be a biological mm -hmm. inoculum. Let's utilize those tools that build upon themselves. The more tools we can have in our toolbox, the quicker we can get a job done to where we want to go. And this is really what he's figured out. He's broke something, so he wants to fix it. I mean, one roller skate on the Buffalo or four. Exactly. You can really get them moving. So the idea behind this, as we were talking about, is basically these, you can already see this was spring wheat, spectrum plus myco and neutronid. Literally at germination, you already see those dreads, like the microbial community around that plant basically utilizing those exudates mm -hmm. because they want the food and then providing that plant with the nutrition that it needs. I mean, one of the things that Dr. White's research also showed when we talk about those root hairs, mm -hmm. those root hairs are developed specifically to spit those beneficial bacteria back out into that soil environment. It's like a little needle, a little yeah. syringe. So the more of those root hairs we have, the more we can split biology yep. out into it kind of gives me the idea i used to put a map up of europe yeah um and if you wanted to get somewhere in europe and you were sending freight there was very limited ways that you can do that but if you wanted to be on a commuter train it was like i used to call it the schematic of the space shuttle it was just unbelievable and if you've ever been to europe and you tried to travel and just trying to figure out where you're going sometimes can be a challenge. So the um, those commuter routes, those are the plant roots themselves. And then all of those little side branches to actually access the small areas, that's your fungi, that's your bacteria. Exactly. And that's your nutrient availability. Yep. You're mining more parts of that soil. Um, this is kind of an interesting one. Uh, this was a deep furrow drill. Uh, I guess one of the problems with this design is that sometimes a furrow sloughs back in, fills back up. The grower is really impressed because of the idea of how far this wheat came up out of it, the soil after that had sloughed back in. And even a little crusting on top of the soil, it was wow. able to break through. But the amazing part, what we like to see here is look at that biological activity that is mm -hmm. going on around these roots. This is what gives it the energy enable, and was enabled it to get up at push out of that because that takes an enormous amount of energy. And this was spring wheat. This was um, uh, James Johnson in New Mexico with AEA. Um, in this case, he used Spectrum DS because of a sodium issue based yeah. off of history. Um, gallon of rejuvenate, sea shield, and label rate of BioCoat Gold. Um, but this has not even emerged out of the soil yet. And you can see the amount of the biological activity, these little fine hairs here that you're seeing um, in that soil environment. This is critical to nutrient availability for those plants. We have to start this at the point. Remember Steve talked about, this is not only NPK, this is also your trace minerals. This yep. is your calcium. All of this is being made available through microbial communities within that soil environment. Well, and we've talked about using live, active, passive versus active blankets. Blankets. It's, a, it's an armor. It's soil armor. This is root armor. I mean, if you look at that root, is there much space for anything else to get in there and attack that plant root? It's protected. And that the biology does this for a reason. It creates a home, an yep. environment. It creates food, shelter, water, all of the things the biology needs right there around that root. And then again, basically it supplies it with the plant. And the other thing is it has a pH yes. design That's a that big the difference. biology wants to live in. So no matter what your soil pH is, the pH around that root right there is more, it's closer to balance because yeah. that's the environment that they want. That nutrition makes such a difference to plants. It health. does. I mean, another example here, but one of the things I, I want to look at here is this gives us not only nutrient availability, but stress. Mm -hmm. I won't even say drought stress, just yeah. stresses, yeah. plant stress. When we start to see the dreadlocks here, like we see on this root, now on this side, a lot of it broke off when we pulled it out of the ground. But the reason I put this, remember we talked about those fine root hairs in the rise of phagy cycle? Look at the amazing amount of root hairs we're seeing here on this corn within that soil environment. And, you know, this is what we call dreadlocks. Another haircut that is out there we talk about is the mohawk. Hmm. Um, we've seen a lot of 
growers that might have the mohawk. It's a less desirable form, I guess, than the dreadlocks. I guess it works in for some people, huh? Yeah. But what you see here is the reason we see these roots going down is a lot of times we say we've got to break that compaction layer. If we're not doing it biologically, we and sometimes even when we are doing it biologically, we have got to put iron into the soil. We got to open up that soil yeah. to get this process started. The reason for that is there's water, there's oxygen, there's all those things here, but we're missing. There is some microbial community here. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong, but we're missing the robust microbial community, partly because of environment um, that they just aren't able to survive. And when we start to think about that is soil is supposed to be 25% air, 25% water, 45% mineral, and then we've got our organisms, our roots, our humus, and our organic matter. But in order to create an environment for the roots, for the microbes, for the basically to mm -hmm. make nutrient availability to that plant, we have to create soil particles. We have to give air space, not only to hold oxygen, but to hold water and to hold nutrients. And that's what gives us that environmental community, or I call it the environment mm -hmm. for that biology to survive, to do all these processes that we've talked about here today. The soil aggradation climb, building it, that aggregate. And I would like to point out, I think we need to find a newer version because that yeah. only says 10% organisms. What the research is finding now, it's 50-50. Yes. A massive amount of unrecognized previously biological life is uh, a major constituent of the organic matter profile and it wasn't fully understood well this is a grower that's not using tiny uh, that's why it's only 10 percent. so see. it'd be 50 percent okay. if, if yeah if they were up and running but this doesn't only happen within the soil environment so yeah we've talked a lot about the pgpr plant growth promoting rhizobacteria but it, it doesn't end there just like our skin our ears our eyes our mouth we have all of these different organisms on and around our body and the plan is the same we can look at different parts of the plant we can look at the the stem we can look at the leaves we can look at the the underside of the leaf we can look at the calyx we can look at the the fruit we can look at all of these different structures of the plant and they all should have organisms there's a few different types that we see uh, one type are known as endophytic and these are organisms that live inside of the plant and they found a pretty great life they're generally pretty well protected and they're usually surrounded by food they exchange with the plant and they're helping that plant's growth, health, and vigor, but they've got a pretty, uh, pretty easy life compared to a lot of these other critters. There's another type of bacteria that grow on the leaf surface, and those are called phylosphere. Those organisms have a pretty hard life. They're surrounded by usually dry air and being bombarded by the sun. So what do they do? They do very similar things like Dennis was just talking about. They need that air, they need that water, they need, they need a home. So they're building a home for themselves on the leaf surface. And a lot of times we'll see a higher diversity and a higher density of organisms on the underside of the leaf because less sun. They're protected from the sun so they don't dry out as quickly. But when you look at these organisms, you can see that they're creating that environment for themselves. They're using their uh, extracellular polysaccharides, their glues, their micro glues to create biofilms to strategically create a home for themselves, but also a lot of this, it's organic matter and it's gonna hold moisture. And the beauty of holding more moisture and having those beneficial organisms, not only do those microbes need the food like we talked about, so they're going to digest and process, but they're also going to keep that soil and, or that, that soil, that leaf environment slightly more moist around that environment. And as we talked about before with foliars, it has to go from a wet environment to the inside of a plant, which is wet. Once that fertilizer that we spray dries out, it has to wait until it rehydrates to become available again. So if we have a live leaf that's full of this diverse <laughs> community of organisms that are making a home and making a living for themselves on there, we can increase foliar efficiency, can't we, Dennis? Yeah, and so that's one of the things, I guess, we take it to the next step of nutrient availability and how this whole process happens in order to achieve overall plant health. It's not only in the soil, it also has to, uh, we also have to look at foliar nutrition, which is critical because proficient performance in plants is strongly associated with that distinct microbial community that is on their, uh, that is around and on the organs. Yeah. Foliar microbiome 
is very important to, as we say here, crop yield. Mm -hmm. With we, we can't ignore it. No. Um, I know a lot of people out there have said that they've tried foliar and, and it doesn't work. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about why that might be. Um, and really, foliar nutrition is critical, in, in my opinion, to achieving optimal genetic potential yeah. of that plant, at least as we're building soil health as we know it today, because in so many cases, we have tie-ups within that soil mm -hmm. environment that it's just not available to that plant, why we're getting this entire system working. And so we have a line of foliar biology designed specifically um, to address this. Now, this is not designed as a standalone fertilizer. I want to kind of point that out. Mm -hmm. This is designed to enhance a good fertilizer program um, that, we've, that we're implementing basically on whatever our crop might be. And a little bit of that is Micro 5000. I get questions on these a little bit. Micro 5000 and PZ1000 are for our conventional agriculture, are non-organic. Again, 5000 and 1000 are for conventional, basically. I look at the Micro 5000 as for growth and vegetative. So early on in the, in the season, on our wheat, on our corn, on our uh, fruit trees, when we're doing that early spring at bud swell, bud break, pre-petal drop, Micro 5000 until we produce fruit. When we're doing that with our calcium, our trace minerals, we want to uh, help the uptake of those into that plant. And we also want to optimize growth. Mm -hmm. That's the micro 5,000. Once we've set fruit and we're into reproductive or fill, then a lot of times I recommend the uh, PZ 1,000. Now for our organic growers, it's the micro 5,000 organic. That's throughout the entire season for those organic growers. Now, a lot of times when we start to look at crops like maybe uh, strawberries or tomatoes, which are shifting from vegetative to reproductive and back and forth, a lot of times I recommend we rotate with the 1,000 and 5,000, um, again, to um, help promote full genetic potential of that plant. But the micro 5,000, the PZ 1,000, the micro 5,000 organic should always be utilized with a good fertilizer program based off of a plant sap analysis. We need that information to see exactly what is that plant telling me that it's not getting from that soil environment. And those are the things that we need to give to that plant. We have to look at the availability of these foliars. Um, what is in those? Remember I say piggybacking on, um, yep. you know, yep. I mean, if we need calcium and we already have plenty of chloride in our plant, don't use calcium chloride. It's, yep. Well, I don't know why you would ever anyway, unless you needed a little bit of chloride. But um, so, yeah, use a form that is going to be beneficial to that plant. And a lot of times on this, I look at, for an example, like wheat is we say, or even fruit trees, we say in the springtime, we want to uh, spray an early application, but we're not to a point yet where we can pull a plant sap analysis or a leaf analysis on those plants use our data that we collected over the previous years to determine what those deficiencies might be. And then we can do an early foliar application. The reason I say that is a lot of times like wheat, for an example, and I'll use wheat, by the time we get that information that we need, we have already jeopardized yield. Yep. And, I, and I wanna talk about that. I mean, here's a prime example. Timing of foliars is critical. If we do, if we wait, a week or two weeks or three weeks after the point of making a, we call it um, critical, critical points, points of influence. Mm -hmm. If you miss that critical points of influence, we have dropped yield. So here's an example on the far left, you see this is biology only, nitrogen fixing bacteria only, nothing else was applied. And you can see to the left and the right, this was, I believe 50 pounds of nitrogen that was applied on this uh, spring wheat. So you can see this was a cool wet spring. The biology didn't kick in. You can see this was intentional. We can see that we're struggling here. Yeah. We're already losing yield. By the time we came in with our foliar application, um, we had missed that opportunity for tillering for we had lost yield. Yeah. And so once that application was made, you can see that biology finally kicked in. The plant got what it needed, but the soil temps even went out. up as well. Soil temps yeah. went up, absolutely. So we have to know the timing of the application is critical. The products that we're applying need to be available and we need to know what 
um, what is in that application so that we make sure we don't piggyback on anything that we don't need. A lot of times when we look at um, mixes of nutrients, we may be putting something out there that we already have an excess of. So mm -hmm. make sure we check our labels because that this is all critical to the plant response that we see on a foliar application. And that's a lot of times why I say people say, I tried it and it didn't work. And obviously timing of the Very application, yeah. you talked about it has to be wet in order for yep. that to get into the plant. Um, we don't want to go out there when it's windy and dry and hot and trying to do a foliar application. Not ideal. Not ideal. So one of the things we look at, I've talked about this a little bit. I'm not going to spend much time on it here today, but I want to know this was a combination of foliar nutrition and soil applied of OPA. Part of this was the fact that there was a deficiency here. This was manganese and iron, basically more manganese than anything. But part of the reason the OP8 was used is because this was along railroad tracks. And um, the, the railroad was coming down with the soil sterilant, a little bit of soil just, sterilant, just, just hardly just any, a, just, just a, a touch. little bit, just a yeah. touch. Um, a light drifting, if you will. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but some of that we assume had leached down through this drainage area of these uh, Asian pears. Huh, weird. I know, it moved. Um, okay. Anyway, uh, with that being said, the grower was going to take these out. He was, the, he was ready. They were seven-year-old trees. He was tired of the fact that they weren't producing and they're producing they poor quality. They were a hangnail, poor quality fruit. Uh, he sent me this last year. This is the same block of trees. This was his highest yielding block Basically, this picture he sent me here is the, I obviously you can see there's a lot of Asian pears, a lot of fruit. This was after they had already picked the trees once. Wow. And so you can also see the leaf structure on these. It's much better. Well, why is that important? Well, it's all key to photosynthesis. So to get everything that we've talked about, every, the reason we're doing everything, we're looking at the biology within the soil, nutrient availability, root mass, yep. we're building soil health, we have our foliar, uh, nutrition going on there. And now we have these great big, what I refer to as solar panels within that soil, with on that plant. They're mm -hmm. not in the soil environment, they're on the plant. Um, and this is collecting energy and helping to put more of these exudates, more of this material back into the soil environment to feed that system, to have it functioning at the highest level. More food out, more food in. And if, if you want to go deeper into how to maximize photosynthesis, John Kempf, AEA, and check out Kind Harvest Kind, as well. Harvest. kind Harvest has some great information, great interviews, and great courses. So, so check out Kind Harvest. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about opiate and bioremediation. Um, this was sent from uh, Soilcraft, and this is actually really amazing what these guys did. It, this was a, a hop field that basically used a chemical, they call it a kill all chemical. Um, it's no longer available on the market, um, but it was utilized in the hop industry. And this hop yard, because of the fact this chemical was used, has not been, no one would grow on it for the last five years because it just wasn't worth the investment and they just couldn't make enough money. Yeah. So they came in and they applied OP8 and a gallon of Pepsime Clear. Um, that was on May 5th. And they did that uh, with two and a half gallons of humic acid and molasses. And then they did that again in July, the exact same application. And then also used with Pacific Grow, in addition to the humic acid and the molasses, Humigrow products. And they were uh, in addition to the OP8. So this was all utilized. Remember, it's, it's not just the biology, but we also have to pay attention to nutrition and feed that biology and keep this whole system going. And they were very good. Everything's at, interconnected. I know it. Bruce used to talk about that. I feel that's like kind of weird. That sounds familiar. I know. Um, the amazing part about this was at the end of the season, it was one of the healthiest looking hop yards. Um, very nice stand, very green, made it to the wire. Everything was excellent. And at harvest time, a lot of times they're chasing the tail to get these hops out of the field because of the invitation of mites. Reason that's important because these mites basically discolor and you have a loss of quality and a loss of money on these hops. Um, so their average yield on this was 9.5, 200 pound bales per acre. Normally this variety does six to 10. Um, the uh, farmer's yield, on the conventional block was eight to eight and a half bales. I mean, this is pretty amazing. It basically paid for the remediation 
unusable um, fields correct to nine and a half bales yeah at a thousand dollars per bale yeah. from nothing well and you know a lot of times i look at is the cost they say well i don't know if i can afford that they couldn't um, use that ground before but what are you losing on this ground yeah. for five years what is the cost associated with this and this was ryan from soil craft i want to say thank you for thank sending you. this to us this is just awesome stuff and if you want us to, to brag about you, please send us pictures, examples of yeah. what you've got going on as well. I mean, and they, they paid attention to everything yeah. here we've talked about today. We made I it know, sound easy. Yeah, it, it's not. And, you know, we've seen that same thing. This was uh, uh, essential oil, lavender. Yeah, beautiful um, area, high yeah. country, beautiful spot. But uh, intentional herbicide application was over applied in one of their. Um, show fields this is right outside their yeah. one of their main office right along the road that everybody yeah. can see uh and it was intentional yeah. over application when steve and i went up there four years ago they were irrigating they were seeding they were trying plugs and there was not a heavy weed. fertilization yeah. heavy amounts of fish yeah five five years four or five years they couldn't get even weeds to grow um so we came in with the same thing the op8 the uh, nutri need in this case and the Pacific Grow did two applications 30 days apart. And now we have lavender growing back in this feed. And I want to tell you, this is the severe cases. I mean, but what we have yeah. to think about as growers is there's a lot of times where we might have just a small amount mm -hmm. of residual of mm -hmm. something within our soil environment that is limiting nutrient uptake by that plant. And so um, a lot of times that's what biology does. I mean, how do biology do this? I mean, Bruce used to talk about if we create something, nature will have a way of breaking it down. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I the the example that we didn't even want to talk about, but popped in my head, Dehalocoides ethanogens is an organism that they found outside of dry cleaning facilities back in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and however long they were dumping all those horribly toxic chemicals just out behind and this is basically an organism that the genetic profile of it scientists said it it shouldn't exist it doesn't have enough intelligence to survive in an environment that's kind of like me well we're, we're doing together we almost function okay <laughs> <laughs> but it utilizes these chemicals as a primary carbon source and it doesn't have enough brain or genetic <laughs> diversity to survive without them and they're only there because people put them there. It's just nature, if given time, and that's a lot of times what natures don't have time for, time. time. I'll say time a few more times. Time. Time. Okay. Yeah. Time. Yeah. And we're almost out of time. Oh, so we thought we're oh, out of time. <laughs> so with that being said, I guess the way I look at it is when we start to talk about, this was a hydraulic spill. We talk about biology and how it breaks it down. It's just food to me. Yeah. That's the way that they yeah. look at it. Um, and obviously some things are harder to break down than mm -hmm. others. We have to pay attention to feed and how we care for them. But this was a fairway, number one fairway, just before one of the members opened, a hydraulic line broke. I just happened to be at the course this day. This course was on our biological program and they actually had a cleaning station where they cleaned all their equipment, all the grass clippings, oil, grease, any everything. chemicals, everything went into this. And then it was pumped into a tank and it was being broken down. Um, with the OP8 and Not, they would it wasn't before we started no. coming and helping <laughs> but they basically had to break it down when it got to a certain level they could irrigate it out onto mm -hmm. the course um, so they happened to have the OP8 there and we sprayed this and you can see this is the 30 days later the day of that members open um, you see no basically discoloration the the, the superintendent thought he was going to have to sod this patch yeah because he was afraid he oh, was going to be have pretty. a strap that'd be pretty yeah and so, you know, I will kind of end here with this, but I want to talk about, so I put this up there. And so often we talk about the reason we do agriculture is to produce food, That's whether it's end. human food, yeah. whether it's for animals, whatever it is, is it's to feed the world. Even, even flowers are psychological food, Dennis. Well, there are for the bees. They're food for the bees. That's true. All right. So when we start to look at human nutrition, we need all of these things in order to survive. When we look at the plant, the plant needs all of these exact same things. And when we look at the soil, 
and the biological community. Yep. It needs all of these things in order to survive, reproduce, grow, supply those things to the plant so that we can have good nutrition. And that's really the reason we do agriculture is to provide so food. So and we're providing food, like you say, for humans, for plants, and for the soil. And that's why this is so critically important. We got to do it right. Yeah. And so with that, I think we're going to go to questions. But before we get to questions, we do have one more note. We're very excited. Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, this is awesome. Uh, Thursday, April 28th, Keith Burns from Green Cover Seed is going to join us mm -hmm. and talk about um, cover crops. Yep. And how cover crops, we're going to have a conversation about how cover crops benefit the soil, the diversity yep. of cover crops, how they feed the biology how this is all connected. And I mean, this is just really exciting. Well, and you mentioned, you know, during presentation, the idea of through, through Jill Clapperton's research and this idea of diversity, it's almost like you were setting us up to learn more about diverse species and some of their exudates, Dennis. I, you know, that might just build in right <laughs> into this. Oh, it's and gonna be a lot of fun. The great part about this is, as I always say, is I know a little bit of cover about cover crops. I talk to growers all the time and they ask me what cover crop. I'm not an expert. The number of times that I've talked to Keith, the information that you receive from him yeah. based on cover crops and plants is just unbelievable. So very exciting for next week. So with that, I guess let's back out of this presentation and let's go to questions. All right, I'm gonna check in the chat. So bear with me for a second. What do we have here? Sorry, we didn't have the chat up while we were doing the presentation because it blocks our screen, but we'll see if we can't get to some of these. Is there a way to use last year's data when you have broad crop rotation and will not grow the same plant a few years? Deficiencies will be different for different crops. Yeah. And, you know, I say that a lot where I work with these guys with the rotations and that's where it takes a little bit of time to get an understanding of your rotation yeah. of the crop you're planting of the field you're planting it in and collect that data. So you know what that deficiency is going to be expressed in that plant like mm -hmm. Jill talked about. It may not be the same for wheat as it is for soybeans. Yeah. Um, so we have to have an understanding, but a lot of times we can make um, educated. Aided, educated guesses. And remember that early foliar nutrition, foliar application is being put out there, as I say, feed weekly, weekly. 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 Yeah. It's a very light application that we want to do. And a lot of times early on, we're talking about, depending on the crop, it might be a little bit of nitrogen, mm -hmm. depending on how much we put out um, in furrow. Calcium is always yeah. critical early on in that plant and your trace minerals. Um, so sometimes it takes a little bit of a process yep. to get an understanding of what you need. But once you have that understanding, we have that information, it is so useful yeah. to help reduce um, plant lag or uh, loss of yield early on, especially when yeah. mother nature throws us a curve. Cool, wet weather, any of those types of things where the plant just doesn't have the energy. It's a good thing she never does that. I and, know it. And Philip, it part of it can also be how many points, how many data points you have pointing in a direction. If you have one species that's showing zinc deficiency, and you have 30 different species that are showing calcium deficiency, I'm going to be more confident that if all of my plants from the previous year keep telling me calcium, 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 or, or phosphorus, phosphorus, phosphorus it's a pretty good chance that I'm gonna need some additional calcium and or phosphorus. If it's not as direct and we can't see that like with a trace mineral, sometimes you have to be really careful because like Dennis said, with an excess, it can be as much harm or worse. Why are you trying to switch slides? Yeah, it's trying to put it. Oh, oh no, get, get on that, that one, one out there. Whoops. Oh, my bad. Whoopsie. Yeah, that was back from a long time ago. Which, I had which... hair and it's even colored. Get off that picture. <laughs> okay, let's see. Question received. Can you use biology as a drench after transplanting? Absolutely. In fact, a lot of times soil drench is if I have a lot of growers that uh, that's actually the way they're applying their bi biology is, in fact, a lot of times I recommend it is 
you know, we have our root dip, which we didn't even talk about no. for trees. Anybody out there that's doing trees, the root dip scenario is huge difference by far. We talk about that rise of phagy cycle. We yeah. talk about nutrient availability. We talk about those root hairs. We have to get that biology in the, and we're already a lot of times in the tree. We're not, we're already behind the abel because we haven't started from the time that tree was planted. It's coming in from a nursery. So that root dip is critical, but absolutely a soil drench. Make sure you use some food with it. Um, if it's going on a uh, soil that might be in contact with some direct sunlight, a little fish, a little humate, some little carbon sources to protect it. Uh, let's see. Can you mix organic carbon-based fertilizer with Micro 5000 or should you do? Oh, no, definitely. We have people that are applying broad, broad types of carbon-based fertility. Fish, as we've mentioned over and over and over, is one of our favorites. We typically don't see issues with tie-up and things like that. As always, do a, do a jar test, check to make sure, but typically carbon-based fertilizers, I have very few cautions for people with. There are some examples of uh, carbon inputs that can be a very, very high or very, very low pH. So we've got to be careful utilizing some of those. And we've got to pay attention to when and how we're mixing. Whenever we're doing anything that contains our biology, we have everybody mix everything, dilute it down as much as you can. And just prior to application, into the field, that's when you put your biology in. So the biology has the least time mixed in with some of those um, usually chemicals. In organic inputs, generally not as much of a concern. Now, a lot of times though, uh, if, if you're doing that, what I look at is if you add the biology last, we make sure we got food, we got carbon, we got protection, we got a buffering agent, a little bit for pH, yeah. all those types of issues. Because yep. a lot of times when you talk about fish, pH because the stability, they have it down no, around low. three, five. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. And, and um, it's, it, it can be a challenge. Some of your, your humates, your fulvics can be very, very high or low. Today is the 31st of April. Why are you talking about the next webinar on the 28th of April? Well, and Michael, how many people looked at this thing? Nobody noticed this. You win. You get the, you get the gold star for the day. Excellent eyes. <laughs> Uh, when you apply bacteria to the leaf, should you do so with a kind of food for them? Yes. Short answer, yes. Absolutely. So a lot of times what I'm looking at on these foliar uh, that I see a lot of times is fish, uh, kelp maybe. Um, yeah. Yeah. Something, humates. Humates. Yep. Car um, car again, carbon-based fertility. And that also protects them from the sun that we have to talk yeah, a little yeah. bit about. Um, and he again- makes her a good sunblock, yeah. Yeah, a good sunblock, but very light rates um, is what we're talking about, especially when we start to look at the humates. And then Amy points out, it's the 31st of March. Yeah. Today, <laughs> I don't even know what day it is. Today is the 31st of March. April as, Fools! As, yeah, as I said, uh, our next webinar is April 28th. Um, and there's not, yep, there's okay. not, there's not 31 days in April, so we can't even confuse that. Oh, that'd yeah. be good though. So yes, today is March 31st and our next webinar is going to be on April. And Keith's doing that one. Dennis and I are doing the one on April 31st, right? Yeah. yeah. Now we've confused everyone. No. Okay. So yes, April 28th, join us for Keith. Uh, let's see. I think we might have a couple more. Go ahead and go back to that. Put that slide up if we can. Which slide? Keith. Ah. There we go. Let's see. If it does not do plant sap analysis, they are leaf extract analysis. And that's true. And I think that you mentioned uh, sap or leaf extracts or whatever form you're yeah. utilizing. But yeah, Mark, you're, you're, you're correct. They label it as leaf extract. Yep. Sap analysis, leaf extract analysis tissue analysis, depending on what lab you're using, yeah. how they do it, they all have a little bit of different. And, and what I talk about is whoever you decide to use and you just stay with them as long as you're getting the information that you need, because you cannot make a comparison from different labs, just you're interpret, interpreting it differently. Yeah. Um, so whoever you're comfortable with, absolutely stick, stick, with, stick them. with them. Yeah. yeah. And petiole, those are, those are the yeah. favorite, right? Yeah. 
generally not our favorite. Uh, mm -hmm. Stefano asking about legacy effects, positive and negative of adding the microbes. Well, oy, uh, that's a hard one. Uh, research is going to take a while to help delve into that, but the reality is we're changing the soil environment. You, you don't have a cropland that hasn't had human intervention. It just, it doesn't exist. All of the, the plains that we used to have. I don't, we talked about buffalo on skates. Do yeah. bison, can you also put skates on bison? You can, okay. you can. They're feet are be... different, so it's a different style. Caribou versus reindeer yeah, exactly. sort of thing? Okay, exactly. yeah. So yes, there are going to be shifts and changes, uh, many of which are going to be positive. Um, the negative side of that, we have seen, uh, typically it's with, uh, single strain approaches when a company is utilizing large quantities of a single strain. Uh, we worked with a grower that was using a large amount, basically the only inoculum, the only thing they were using as biological was Trichoderm arzionum. And it, it, had a, it has a tendency to shift the environment in one direction. So when we're, we're utilizing single species, I think that we typically have a bit more caution than when we're coming at this in a more sustainable way that incorporates a lot of different species so that we don't create a preponderance of one, uh, which, which can be harmful in the environment. And we well, did see a little bit of lag with the micro, some of the mycorrhizal. If we have, the, the research goes back levels. and forth on trichoderma. Some say that the mycoparasitism is good for the myco. Some say it's bad. Some say it's Tuesday. Some say it's Wednesday. Depends on when the research comes out. So yes, there, there are going to be some long-term um, a lot of times benefits. If you're in a soil environment that has received a lot of fungicide, and we're now seeing a lot of red root pigweed, we're seeing a lot of brassica weeds that are growing in that environment, that's usually a strong indication that all the mycorrhizae and fungi that used to be there have died. So if we start incorporating uh, cover crops that are friends with the mycorrhizal fungi, and we start applying mycorrhizal fungi, we're now going to have those organisms back in the environment. So yeah, that, that can be I mean, glomalin lasts for decades, so minimum of decades on some of those positive um, benefits. I think I well, shattered that one. Yeah, and as Bruce used to talk about, he never wanted to take the single mind microbe approach, always diversity. And the other thing that we have to talk about is in agriculture, generally a monoculture, generally we've disrupted that soil environment. And I always refer to it as habitat. If we can build the habitat, the oxygen, yep. the water, yep. the yep. food, the holding capability, the homes, the environment. If we can build all those things, everybody else comes. Now we can sustain a system much yep. better than we can based on agriculture today. In Let's, some cases. In some cases. Let's see. Sulfur, excuse me, to control mildew on grapes, can I mix the micro 5000 with sulfur? So if, if we're using fertility levels of copper or sulfur, we don't see issues with adding the microbes. If we're using curative levels of sulfur, copper, um, we generally want to have a great deal of caution and we typically want to separate those applications. If we know we're going into a stress time, a lot of times the growers are adding a little bit of spectrum to the foliar program, five to 10 grams per acre. And that's just to increase the species density and diversity on that leaf. So with, yeah, with lots control. of sulfur, if you're using a control product and the, the sulfur is there to control microorganisms, we're going to take a hit. The, yeah. the beneficial species are going to take a hit. Some are going to do better than others. Your bacillus are probably going to be fine because they're an endospore, some of your streptomyces, some of your pseudomonads, probably going to take a bigger hit. And a lot of times I talk about, you know, I, I call it the Isle of Death, spray life or spray death. Um, if we've done that as copper or sulfur as a control agent, a lot of times if we can follow up with a good foliar application of a light nutrition yep. package, but with biology, get yep. life back out yep. onto that leaf, um, beneficial life back onto that leaf and pay attention to our calcium levels. Get your calcium levels up, especially if you're paying, spraying that mildew early on yeah. on your crop. Makes a big difference. That calcium pectate, the, the flexing of the cells to keep those micro pores and micro fractures and fissures closed. Pretty critical. 
Well, it's been an hour uh, and seven minutes. Wow. No, yeah. it's been longer than that. Yeah, it has. So <laughs> Woo, thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys all next month in April mm -hmm. on the 28th. <laughs> don't ask me. Obviously, yeah. don't don't ask yeah. me. Uh, and we look forward to having Keith with us. So thanks, oh, everybody. Yeah. Um, if you have any questions, you can always email Steve, myself, info at tinyo.com. Um, send us an email if you have questions, if we didn't get to them or answer them. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Same bat time, Same different bat station. Bat but it's a different station if we consider the date the station no we're, we're not calling it the same it's a thursday it's a thursday. same bat time same bat station that's right thanks, thanks everybody, everybody. <laughs>